The Thing in the Hall by E.F. Benson and read by Christopher Holton. The following pages are the account given me by Dr. Asherton of The Thing in the Hall. I took notes as copious as my quickness of hand allowed me from his dictation and subsequently read to him this narrative in its transcribed and connected form. This was on the day before his death, which indeed probably occurred within an hour after I had left him, and as readers of inquests and such atrocious literature may remember, I had to give evidence before the coroner's jury. Only a week before Dr. Asherton had to give similar evidence, but as a medical expert with regard to the death of his friend, Louis Fielder, which occurred in a manner identical with his own. As a specialist, he said he believed that his friend had committed suicide while of unsound mind, and the verdict was brought in accordingly. But in the inquest held over Dr. Asherton's body, though the verdict eventually returned was the same, there was more room for doubt. For I was bound to state that only shortly before his death, I read what follows to him that he corrected me with extreme precision on a few points of detail, that he seemed perfectly himself, and that at the end he used these words, I am quite certain as a brain specialist that I am completely sane, and that these things happened not merely in my imagination, but in the external world. If I had to give evidence again about poor Louis, I should be compelled to take a different line. Please put that down at the end of your account, or at the beginning, if it arranges itself better so. There will be a few words I must add at the end of this story, and a few words of explanation must precede it. Briefly, they are these. Francis Asherton and Louis Fielder were up at Cambridge together, and they formed the friendship that lasted nearly till their death. In general attributes, no two men could have been less alike for while Dr. Asherton had become at the age of 35 the first and final authority on his subject, which was the functions and diseases of the brain, Louis Fielder at the same age was still on the threshold of achievement. Asherton, apparently without any brilliance at all, had by careful and incessant work arrived at the top of his profession, while Fielder, brilliant at school, brilliant at college and brilliant ever afterwards, had never done anything. He was too eager, so it seemed to his friends, to set about the dreary work of patient investigation and logical deductions. He was forever guessing and prying, and striking out luminous ideas, which he left burning, so to speak, to illumine the work of others. But at bottom the two men had this compelling interest in common, namely an insatiable curiosity after the unknown perhaps the most potent bond yet devised between the solitary units that make up the race of man. Both, till the end, were absolutely fearless, and Dr. Asherton would sit by the bedside of the man, stricken with bubonic plague, to note the gradual surge of the tide of disease, to the reasoning faculty with the same absorption as Fielder would study X-rays one week, flying machines the next, and spiritualism the third. The rest of the story, I think, explains itself, or does not quite do so. This, anyhow, is what I read to Dr. Asherton, being the connected narrative of what he had himself told me. It is he, of course, who speaks. After I returned from Paris, where I had studied under Charcot, I set up practice at home. The general doctrine of hypnotism, suggestion and cure, by such means, had been accepted even in London by this time and owing to a few papers I had written on the subject together with my foreign diplomas, I found that I was a busy man almost as soon as I had arrived in town. Louis Fielder had his ideas about how I should make my debut, for he had ideas on every subject and all of them original, and entreated me to come and live not in the stronghold of doctors, Chloroform Square, as he called it, but down in Chelsea where there was a house vacant next his own. Who cares where a doctor lives, he said, so long as he cures people. Besides, you don't believe in old methods. Why believe in old localities? Oh, there is an atmosphere of painless death in Chloroform Square. Come and make people live instead. And on most evenings, I shall have so much to tell you. I can't drop in across half London. Now, if you have been abroad for five years, it is a great deal to know that you have any intimate friend at all still left in the metropolis. And, as Lewis said, to have that intimate friend next door is an excellent reason for going next door. 
Above all, I remembered from Cambridge days what Louise dropping in meant. Towards bedtime, when work was over, there would come a rapid step on the landing, and for an hour or two hours he would gush with ideas. He simply diffused life, which is ideas, wherever he went. He fed one's brain, which is the one thing which matters. Most people who are ill are ill because their brain is starving and the body rebels and gets lumbago or cancer. That is the chief doctrine of my work, such as it has been. All bodily disease springs from the brain. It is merely the brain that has to be fed and rested and exercised properly to make the body absolutely healthy and immune from all disease. But when the brain is affected, it is as useful to pour medicines down the sink as make your patient swallow them, unless, and this is a paramount limitation, unless he believes in them. I said something of the kind to Louis one night when at the end of a busy day I had dined with him. We were sitting over coffee in the hall, or so it is called, where he takes his meals. Outside, his house is just like mine, and 10,000 other small houses in London, but on entering, instead of finding a narrow passage with a door on one side, leading into the dining room, which again communicates with a small back room called the study, he has had the sense to eliminate all unnecessary walls, and consequently the whole ground floor of his house is one room, with stairs leading up to the first floor. Study, dining room and passage have been knocked into one. You enter a big room from the front door. The only drawback is that the postman makes loud noises close to you as you dine, and just as I made these commonplace observations to him about the effect of the brain on the body and the senses, there came a loud rap somewhere close to me that was startling. You ought to muffle your knocker, I said, anyhow during the time of meals. Louis leaned back and laughed. There isn't a knocker, he said. You were startled a week ago and said the same thing. So I took the knocker off. The letters slide in now, but you heard a knock, did you? Didn't you, said I. Why, certainly. But it wasn't the postman, it was the thing. I don't know what it is. That makes it so interesting. Now, if there is one thing that the hypnotist, the believer in unexplained influences, detests and despises, it is the whole root notion of spiritualism. Drugs are not more opposed to his belief than the exploded, discredited idea of the influence of spirits on our lives. And both are discredited for the same reason. It is easy to understand how brain can act on brain, just as it is easy to understand how body can act on body, so that there is no more difficulty in the reception of the idea that the strong mind can direct the weak one than there is in the fact of a wrestler of greater strength overcoming one of less. But that spirits should rap at furniture and divert the course of events is as absurd as administering phosphorus to strengthen the brain. That was what I thought then. However, I felt sure it was the postman, and instantly rose and went to the door. There were no letters in the box, and I opened the door. The postman was just ascending the steps. He gave the letters into my hand. Louis was sipping his coffee when I came back to the table. Have you ever tried table turning? he asked. It's rather odd. No, and I have not tried violet leaves as a cure for cancer, I said. Oh, try everything, he said. I know that that is your plan, just as it is mine. All these years that you have been away, you have tried all sorts of things, first with no faith, then with just a little faith, and finally with mountain-moving faith, why, you didn't believe in hypnotism at all when you went to Paris. He rang the bell as he spoke, and his servant came up and cleared the table. While this was being done, we strolled about the room, looking at prints, with applause for a Bartolozzi that Louis had bought in the new cut, and dead silence over a Perdita, which he had acquired at considerable cost. Then he sat down again at the table on which we had dined. It was round and mahogany-heavy, with a central foot divided into claws. Try its weight, he said. See if you can push it about. So I held the edge of it in my hands and found that I could just move it, but that was all. It required the exercise of a good deal of strength to stir it. Now put your hands on the top of it, he said, and see what you can do. I could not do anything. My fingers merely slipped about on it. But I protested at the idea of spending the evening thus. I would much sooner play chess or noughts and crosses with you, I said, or even talk about politics than turn tables. 
You won't mean to push, nor shall I, but we shall push without meaning to. Louis nodded. Just a minute, he said. Let us both put our fingers only on the top of the table and push for all we are worth, from right to left. We pushed. At least I pushed. And I observed his fingernails. From pink they grew to white because of the pressure he exercised. So I must assume that he pushed too. Once, as we tried this, the table creaked, but it did not move. Then there came a quick peremptory rap, not, I thought, on the front door, but somewhere in the room. It's the thing, said he. Today, as I speak to you, I suppose it was. But on that evening it seemed only like a challenge. I wanted to demonstrate its absurdity. For five years, on and off, I've been studying rank spiritualism, he said. I haven't told you before because I wanted to lay before you certain phenomena which I can't explain, but which now seem to me to be at my command. You shall see and hear, and then decide if you will help me. And in order to let me see better, you are proposing to put out the lights, I said. Yes, you will see why. I am here as a sceptic, said I. Skep away, said he. Next moment the room was in darkness, except for a very faint glow of firelight. The window curtains were thick, and no street illumination penetrated them, and the familiar cheerful sounds of pedestrians and wheeled traffic came in muffled. I was at the side of the table towards the door. Louis was opposite me, for I could see his figure dimly silhouetted against the glow from the smouldering fire. Put your hands on the table, he said, quite lightly, and, how shall I say it, expect. Still protesting in spirit, I expected. I could hear his breathing rather quickened, and it seemed to me odd that anybody could find excitement in standing in the dark over a large mahogany table, expecting. Then, through my fingertips laid lightly on the table, there began to come a faint vibration, like nothing so much as the vibration through the handle of a kettle when water is beginning to boil inside it. This got gradually more pronounced and violent till it was like the throbbing of a motor car. It seemed to give off a low humming note, then, quite suddenly, the table seemed to slip from under my fingers and began very slowly to revolve. Keep your hands on it and move with it, said Louis, and as he spoke I saw his silhouette pass away from in front of the fire, moving as the table moved. For some moments there was silence, and we continued, rather absurdly, to circle round keeping step, so to speak, with the table. Then Louis spoke again, and his voice was trembling with excitement. Are you there? he said. There was no reply, of course, and he asked it again. This time there came a rap like that which I had thought during dinner to be the postman. But whether it was that the room was dark, or that despite myself I felt rather excited too, it seemed to me now to be far louder than before. Also, it appeared to come neither from here nor there, but to be diffused through the room. Then the curious revolving of the table ceased, but the intense, violent throbbing continued. My eyes were fixed on it, though, owing to the darkness, I could see nothing, when quite suddenly a little speck of light moved across it so that for an instant I saw my own hands. Then came another and another, like the spark of matches struck in the dark, or like fireflies crossing the dusk in southern gardens. Then came another knock of shattering loudness, and the throbbing of the table ceased and the lights vanished. Such were the phenomena at the first seance at which I was present, but Fielder, it must be remembered, had been studying expecting, he called it, for some years. To adopt spiritualistic language, which at that time I was very far from doing, he was the medium, I merely the observer, and all the phenomena I had seen that night were habitually produced or witnessed by him. I make this limitation since he told me that certain of them now appeared to be outside his own control altogether. The knockings would come when his mind, as far as he knew, was entirely occupied in other matters, and sometimes he had even been awakened out of sleep by them. The lights were also independent of his volition. Now my theory at the time was that all these things were purely subjective in him, and that what he expressed by saying that they were out of his control meant that they had become fixed and rooted in the unconscious self, of which we know so little, but which more and more we see to play so enormous a part in the life of a man.
In fact, it is not too much to say that the vast majority of our deeds spring, apparently without volition, from this unconscious self. All hearing is the unconscious exercise of the oral nerve. All seeing of the optic, all walking, all ordinary movement seem to be done without the exercise of will on our part. Nay more, should we take to some new form of progression, skating for instance, the beginner will learn with falls and difficulty the outside edge, but within a few hours of his having learned his balance on it, he will give no more thought to what he learned so short a time ago as an acrobatic feat than he gives to the placing of one foot before the other. But to the brain specialist all this was intensely interesting, and to the student of hypnotism as I was, even more so, for such was the conclusion I came to after this first seance, the fact that I saw and heard just what Louis saw and heard was an exhibition of thought transference, which in all my experience in the Charcot schools I had never seen surpassed, if indeed rivalled. I knew that I was myself extremely sensitive to suggestion, and my part in it this evening I believed to be purely that of the receiver of suggestions so vivid that I visualized and heard these phenomena which existed only in the brain of my friend. We talked over what had occurred upstairs. His view was that the thing was trying to communicate with us. According to him it was the thing that moved the table and tapped and made us see streaks of light. Yes, but the thing, I interrupted. What do you mean? Is it a great uncle? Oh, I have seen so many relatives appear at seances and heard so many of their dreadful platitudes. Or what is it? A spirit. Whose spirit? Louis was sitting opposite to me, and on the little table before us there was an electric light. Looking at him I saw the pupil of his eye suddenly dilate. To the medical man, provided that some violent change in the light is not the cause of the dilation, that meant only one thing, terror, but it quickly resumed its normal proportion again. Then he got up and stood in front of the fire. No, I don't think it is great uncle anybody, he said. I don't know, as I told you, what the thing is, but if you ask me what my conjecture is, it is that the thing is an elemental. And pray explain further, what is an elemental? Once again his eye dilated. It will take two minutes, he said. But listen, there are good things in this world, are there not, and bad things? Cancer, I take it is bad, and, and fresh air is good. Honesty is good, lying is bad. Impulses of some sort direct both sides, and some power suggests the impulses. Well, I went into this spiritualistic business impartially. I learned to expect to throw open the door into the soul, and I said, anyone may come in. And I think something has applied for admission, the thing that tapped and turned the table and struck matches, as you saw, across it. Now the control of the evil principle in the world is in the hands of a power which entrusts its errands to the things which I call elementals. Oh, they have been seen. I doubt not that they will be seen again. I did not and do not ask good spirits to come in. I don't want the church's one foundation played on a musical box, nor do I want an elemental. I only threw open the door. I believe the thing has come into my house and is establishing communication with me. Oh, I want to go the whole hog. What is it? In the name of Satan, if necessary, what is it? I just want to know. What followed, I thought then, might easily be an invention of the imagination. But what I believed to have happened was this. A piano with music on it was standing at the far end of the room by the door, and a sudden draught entered the room, so strong that the leaves turned. Next the draught troubled a vase of daffodils, and the yellow heads nodded. Then it reached the candles that stood close to us, and they fluttered, burning blue and low. Then it reached me, and the draught was cold and stirred my hair. Then it eddied, so to speak, and went across to Louis, and his hair also moved, as I could see. Then it went downwards towards the fire, and flames suddenly started up in its path, blown upwards. The rug by the fireplace flapped also. Funny, wasn't it? he asked. And has the elementor gone up the chimney? said I. Oh, no, said he, the thing only passed us. Then suddenly he pointed at the wall just behind my chair, and his voice cracked as he spoke. Look, what's that? he said, there on the wall. Considerably startled, I turned in the direction of his shaking finger. 
The wall was pale grey in tone, and sharp cut against it was a shadow that, as I looked, moved. It was like the shadow of some enormous slug, legless and fat, some two feet high by about four feet long. Only at one end of it was a head shaped like the head of a seal, with open mouth and panting tongue. Then, even as I looked, it faded, and from somewhere close at hand there sounded another of those shattering knocks. For a moment after there was silence between us, and horror was thick as snow in the air. But somehow neither Louis or I were frightened for more than one moment. The whole thing was so absorbingly interesting. That's what I mean by its being outside my control, he said. I said I was ready for any, any visitor to come in, and by God, we've got a beauty. Now I was still, even in spite of the appearance of this shadow, quite convinced that I was only taking observations of a most curious case of disordered brain, accompanied by the most vivid and remarkable thought transference. I believed that I had not seen a slug-like shadow at all, but that Louis had visualized this dreadful creature so intensely that I saw what he saw. I found also that his spiritualistic trash books, which I thought a truer nomenclature than textbooks, mention this as a common form for elementals to take. He, on the other hand, was more firmly convinced than ever that we were dealing not with a subjective, but an objective phenomenon. For the next six months or so we sat constantly, but made no further progress, nor did the thing or its shadow appear again, and I began to feel that we were really wasting time. Then it occurred to me to get in a so-called medium, induce hypnotic sleep, and see if we could learn anything further. This we did, sitting as before round the dining room table. The room was not quite dark, and I could see sufficiently clearly what happened. The medium, a young man, sat between Louis and myself, and without the slightest difficulty I put him into a light hypnotic sleep. Instantly there came a series of the most terrific raps, and across the table there slid something more palpable than a shadow with a faint luminance about it, as if the surface of it was smouldering. At the moment the medium's face became contorted to a mask of hellish terror. Mouth and eyes were both open, and the eyes were focused on something close to him. The thing waving its head came closer and closer to him, and reached out towards his throat. Then, with a yell of panic and warding off this horror with his hands, the medium sprang up, but it had already caught hold and for the moment he could not get free. Then, simultaneously, Louis and I went to his aid, and my hands touched something cold and slimy. But pull as we could, we could not get it away. There was no firm handhold to be taken. It was as if one tried to grasp slimy fur, and the touch of it was horrible, unclean, like a leper. Then, in a sort of despair, though I still could not believe that the horror was real, for it must be a vision of diseased imagination. I remembered that the switch of the four electric lights was close to my hand. I turned them all on. There on the floor lay the medium. Louis was kneeling by him with a face of wet paper, but there was nothing else there. Only the collar of the medium was crumpled and torn, and on his throat were two scratches that bled. The medium was still in hypnotic sleep, and I woke him. He felt at his collar, put his hand to his throat, and found it bleeding, but, as I expected, knew nothing whatever of what had passed. We told him that there had been an unusual manifestation, and he had, while in sleep, wrestled with something. We had got the result we wished for, and were much obliged to him. I never saw him again. A week after that he died of blood poisoning. From that evening dates the second stage of this adventure. The thing had materialized. I use again spiritualistic language, which I still did not use at the time. The huge slug, the elemental, manifested itself no longer by knocks and waltzing tables, nor yet by shadows. It was there in a form that could be seen and felt. But it still, this was my strong point, was only a thing of twilight. The sudden kindling of the electric light had shown us that there was nothing there. In this struggle perhaps the medium had clutched his own throat, Perhaps I had grasped Louis's sleeve, he mine. But though I said these things to myself, I am not sure that I believe them in the same way that I believe the sun will rise tomorrow. Now, as a student of brain functions and a student in hypnotic affairs, 
I ought perhaps to have steadily and unremittingly pursued this extraordinary series of phenomena, but I had my practice to attend to, and I found that with the best will in the world I could think of nothing else except the occurrence in the hall next door, so I refused to take part in any further seance with Louis. I had another reason also. For the last four or five months he was becoming depraved. I have been no prude or puritan in my own life, and I hope I have not turned a pharisaical shoulder on sinners, but in all branches of life and morals Louis had become infamous. He was turned out of a club for cheating at cards and narrated the event to me with gusto. He had become cruel. He tortured his cat to death. He had become bestial. I used to shudder as I passed his house, expecting I knew not what fiendish thing to be looking at me from the window. Then came a night only a week ago when I was awakened by an awful cry swelling and falling and rising again. It came from next door. I ran downstairs in my pyjamas and out into the street. The policeman on the beat had heard it too, and it came from the hall of Louis's house, the window of which was open. Together we burst the door in. You know what we found. The screaming had ceased but a moment before, but he was dead already. Both jugulars were severed, torn open. It was dawn, early and dusky, when I got back to my house next door. Even as I went in, something seemed to push by me, something soft and slimy. It could not be Louis's imagination this time. Since then, I have seen glimpses of it every evening. I am awakened at night by tappings, and in the shadows in the corner of my room, there sits something more substantial than a shadow. Within an hour of my leaving Dr. Asherton, the quiet street was once more aroused by cries of terror and agony. He was already dead, and in no other manner than his friend, when they got into the house. The End <laughs>